everyone. Welcome once again to another fantastic, exciting webinar. Today's webinar is how you can impact your ecosystem, careers in ecosystem, restoration and regenerative ag. Um, the series is called Rescuing Mother Earth. Um, although I also will add that we get to collaborate with Mother, Mother Earth. She knows a lot about what to do and that is part of, part of our role. So welcome as you're coming on in. Uh, feel free to introduce or welcome yourself to this space by writing who you are in the chat and where you're coming to us from today. Um, I, my name is Dr. Adrian Godshot, as you'll hear, and I am coming to you today from Oregon. Um, and, oh man, we have so many fun folks. Idaho, Germany, Texas, this is one of my favorite parts of all of these webinars is getting to see the global nature of our communities. Oh, we got Lisbon, Singapore, Brussels, London, Oakland, Hampshire, Maine, France, Fresno, Italy. This is so fun. Ottawa, Costa Rica, Portland, Oregon, BC. Fantastic. Oh, Hawaii, Canary Islands. Suiza, we oui. <laughs> San Diego. Oh man, this is great. Okay, so as folks are coming in, again, feel free to welcome yourself because it is super fun to see how global our consciousness is in thinking about our ecosystems and restoring soils, bringing life back to soil. So thanks for being all around the world. It helps me to be able to relax, but it's not all on me to restore all of the soils and our ecosystems. So let's get uh, just from our panelists, um, I'd love to hear where you come, are coming from today. So Katie, welcome. Hello, I'm Katie. Nice to meet everyone. And I'm here in Brazil, um, about 50 kilometers outside Rio de Janeiro in the Atlantic forest that you can see behind me. Gorgeous. Thank you. Renald. Hi. So my name is Renald. Um, I'm French. However, uh, I'm now sitting in Peru. In South America, I have a couple of projects going on here, and I'm so glad to be here. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. It's so great to have you. And Keisha and Casey. Hey, we're coming. Uh, we're in uh, Los Angeles right now, actually. Uh, usually we're up in Grass Valley, but right now we happen to be in LA. We're doing all sorts of work all over California. Thanks, folks. And again, my name is Dr. Adrian Gottschalk, and I'm coming to you from Oregon. Also, the uh, unceded lands of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Clackamas and the Confederated Tribes of the Celeste Indians and the Cowlitz. So let's get rolling. Okay, one quick reminder that this webinar is a part of a larger series that's been going on this month, um, all of which are available on YouTube for you to be able to see. Uh, this webinar series is a bit of a celebration of a collaborative effort happening between the Soil Food Web School and Ecosystem Restoration Camps. So um, today, the, our focus is on how you can impact your ecosystem, careers in ecosystem restoration and regenerative ag. All right, and once again, feel free to go back and visit some of these wonderful conversations we've already been having this month. Okay, today, here you are. The chat is a fantastic place. That is the single thought bubble or conversation bubble right here. That's a great place for you to get to engage with your fellow attendees, um, discuss, pose, you know, just discussion topics. But if you want your, your topics, your questions to make it to this conversation or have the chance to be selected, uh, the Q&A button is where those questions belong. So feel free to add your questions. Go ahead and start. If you have general questions, feel free to start adding them now to that Q&A, the double thought or conversation bubbles um, for your questions. Okay, so with that, let's get to know our panelists and how they got here. A major focus today is gonna be about how their lives and their careers and what has inspired them has led them to the work that they're doing in re ecosystem restoration. So we're gonna start with Katie Vine at Weintraub. Uh, the Partnerships and Programs Coordinator at one of the many um, ecosystem restoration camps, ecosystem restoration camp Sinal de Valle in Brazil. Uh, then we're going to hear from Renald Flores, 
a soil food web graduate and one of our consultants. The and his company is called Flores System, the which is based now in Europe and South America, as we just heard. And then we have Casey, Casey and Keisha Ernst, both soil food web consultants, graduates, and composters. Uh, they produce commercial compost that is. Uh, widely known amongst my students as they love it. It is beautiful and fungal rich and nematode rich and so all kinds of good critters in there. So then um, one quick note about careers. I am also a representative here for the education side of how one can impact your ecosystem. If you are someone who likes to host webinars or teach or want to get into academic research, I am more than happy to be a support for you in figuring out how to access some of those careers. So then we'll get plenty of time to have a Q&A with all of our presenters. So with that, I am going to pass this on to, oh, in just a moment. So first, as this is a celebration, uh, our Dr. Land Soil Food Web School has collaborated with Ecosystem Restoration Camps in co-creating a series of programs that are going to just enrich your thinking in how to think on an ecosystem scale in different kinds of ecosystems, and that is to be coming soon. But to help you get to know a little bit more about ecosystem restoration camps, uh, one of the over 50 camps is in Brazil, and here to talk about it today, we have Katie Weintraub. Katie, take it away. Thank you so much. So, um, as I said, I'm Katie. I'm here in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, outside of Rio de, the city of Rio de Janeiro. I am originally from the United States, from Colorado, Denver, Colorado. And I've been living here in Brazil at Sinal um, for the last seven years. I came here to spend six months when I graduated college, and I'm still here. So um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my journey here and some of the stuff that we do. Uh, yes, if you can go to the next slide. So in 2014, um, I was graduating college. I was a young 22 year old and figuring out what to do with my life. Um, I was really committed to social causes, inequality, economic development and health. Um, I studied government and global health policy at Harvard. Um, and at that moment, I was seeing all my friends applying to be consultants or investment bankers or the people who are more socially conscious were looking to work at the World Bank or the UN. And I just didn't identify with any of these things. Um, and I, I felt this really strong urge to have an experience that was different, that was adventurous, um, that was I always loved Latin America. Um, and I really felt this need to understand better how the world works. Um, so I was also, I was really interested in health and health policy. And so actually how I kind of discovered this interest in, in soil and ecosystem restoration and ecosystem restorations was through this interest in health. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, I, I, I looked at how in the United States, how our healthcare system was treating illness and not preventing illness and promoting health. And I got really interested in food and seeing this connection between access to good food and health outcomes. Um, so I had this curiosity of, I feel like I need to learn more about food. Like, where does our food come from? How is it planted? How, I didn't know anything. I didn't study anything about agriculture, about environmentalism, really in college. Um, so I had this, I said, you know, I really want to, after college, I want to go to somewhere in Latin America and I want to learn about sustainable agriculture. And I, a few different things happened that I got really interested in Brazil. I didn't speak Portuguese, um, but I really wanted to go to Brazil. So I literally put into Google sustainable agriculture, Brazil and Sinal do Valley appeared. So I reached out um, to Thais, who's the director here, um, who's now my uh, director for many years, a great friend and a mentor. And I told her what I was interested in. And she said, come be a volunteer, come for three or four months um, and have an experience. So I hopped on a plane after college. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing, <laughs> but I had faith that this was going to be a good experience. And with the idea that I would probably come back and you know, do a more nor normal career after. Well, so I came to Sinal and you can go to the next slide. And I ended up falling in love with the country, with the project. And um, I was thrown into this whole world that I didn't know anything about, about reforestation, about agriculture. Um, and 
And I think what was so amazing was I was, you know, really interested in health. And once I got here, I realized how interconnected everything is. And Brazil is a place where it's very obvious how food production is degrades the ecosystems, our current system. There are places that used to be all forest that you drive by and are now just soybean farms or um, cattle ranching. And so it's very visceral. It's very much in your face. So I started really getting it just totally interested in how to find ways to grow food that didn't destroy our ecosystems. So that's kind of what we do at Sinal. We do many things, um, but Sinal is a center for regeneration of ecosystems, communities, and individuals. And ecosystems, we focus on the Atlantic rainforest, this biome, um, which is one of the most biodiverse and threatened biomes on, in the world with only 12% of original forest cover. Um, communities, we focus on the peri-urban communities that surround Rio de Janeiro and individuals. Um, we believe that change starts from within, within ourselves. So we are guardians of 200 hectares of land um, in, in the Atlantic forest. And we are an advanced post of UNESCO's biosphere reserves. And we are one of 17 certified global ecosphere retreats. Um, and at CNAL, we prototype and experiment and then teach solutions for the regeneration of forests, soils, and food systems. But always with this idea of everything we do can be replicated, can be scaled um, for this region that's so important. Um, and actually 70% of the Brazilian population gets water from the Atlantic forest. So this ecosystem is really critical for, for human health. So next slide. So just to give an idea, Sinal is a very, what, what I loved about Sinal was it was a very integrative place because I, what I didn't like before when I was in college is I felt like everything was so separated. It was like economics is this, health is this environment is this. And at CNAL, we have a really integrative approach. So the four main areas that we work are change agents, which is all of our work with education, whether it's little kids who come here to learn about uh, sustainability or global change agents and leaders that come for our leadership retreats, our international courses. Um, we have a lot of international people who've come here through, through these, um, these uh, courses and, and retreats. Um, and then resilient infrastructure, which is all of our work with bioconstruction and water, uh, wastewater systems and recycling. And then soil, food and forest, which is everything from our from permaculture to reforestation to compost to local food. Um, you can go to the next slide. And just to show, so this is our Orta Mandala, which is a mandala garden that was designed by this amazing permaculture technician, um, where this is where we produce our food um, and uh, teach people how to create their own gardens here. Um, and this is, this is an amazing project because this used to be a, a soccer field and before it was a plantation, a banana plantation. So the soil was very degraded. Um, and I love when I take people on the tour here and I get people to sit down and grab the soil in their hands and they see how rich and full of life it is um, and show what it used to be like before. So next slide. And um, this is one of our big restoration projects. It's really exciting to get to see Sinal grow in the last seven years that I've been here. Um, when I came here, it was all living laboratory, lots of volunteers from around the world, international people building the gardens and painting the houses. And it was, you know, that kind of eco villa hippie vibe, and it was great. Um, but over the years, we've also transformed and structured. And now we joke that we're corporate hippies. Um, so we have, you know, we, you know, to see these projects really grow. So now in the last two years, we've been doing a restoration or one year, we've been doing a restoration project where we're planting 54,000 seedlings, native trees, and reforesting 30 hectares of land of native Mata Atlantica, and using different restoration techniques. Um, next slide. Um, next project that is very close to my heart um, is Madre Frutos, which was is a startup that we created here at Sinal and is now starting to flourish on its own, um, which is jackfruit, green jackfruit. Um, I don't know if any of you have eaten green jackfruit, it's starting to become more popular uh, around the world, but Brazil is full of jackfruit. Um, yet the market and the knowledge of green jackfruit as a meat substitute is very small, very few people know about it. Um, and so when we discovered this here, we started using jackfruit in all of our food, and we saw that there's this huge opportunity to use jackfruit as a culinary meat substitute because jackfruit, these, these are these massive fruits, and when you process them in their green form, they have many different parts that some 
are like shredded chicken. Some are like uh, shrimp. Some are like, can taste like fish and make them like ceviche. Um, so we created a jackfruit processing factory where um, local women from the community here work and produce the jackfruit. Some of them um, work with uh, uh, the management aspect of it as well. And we sell the green jackfruit to restaurants and supermarkets in the area. And this project is very close to my heart because I, I last year I just finished my master's in sustainable development practice here at one of the federal universities in Brazil. And I actually did my dissertation about jackfruit and about this project. Um, I didn't even know what jackfruit was when I moved to Brazil and now I've written 150 pages <laughs> about jackfruit. Um, but actually I was looking at the need to integrate uh, environmental public policy with food security policy in Brazil and internationally. And I was doing a case study on how sustainable management of jackfruit trees in uh, buffer zones of protected areas like where we're located um, is a way to do this. So I did all these interviews with the park managers with uh, because jackfruit is, a, is an exotic species, so they don't want it in the protected areas. Um, but instead of cutting down the tree, we say, why don't we eat it to be that, you know, eat the jackfruit to control its expansion? Because there are some areas where there's a lot of jackfruit and it's not native. Um, so I did interviews with, with the school nurse, a uh, nutritionist to look at how we could integrate green jackfruit into the school system as a, as a school lunch meal and provide income from, for local landowners and uh, farmers by also promoting a healthy food. So anyway, I know lots about jackfruit and um, that's, a, that's one project that emerged, was incubated at Sinal and is now growing into its own small business. Uh, next slide. And this is our newest project and a project I'm very excited about. Um, it is the Guanabara Bay Long Distance Trail. So up until now, Sinal, we've worked a lot on like our land and our, our space. But the idea is not to just exist for ourselves, it's to have an impact in the whole region. So we've teamed up with two of our partners, El Nagual and Hegua, which are two other centers for restoration that are incredible. Um, and we are designing a hundred kilometer long distance trail for hiking and biking that's going to connect five cities, nine protected areas, and these three regeneration centers. And the idea is to use ecotourism and agroecotourism as a way to catalyze a transition to a more regenerative economy. Because this region, as you can see, this is around the Guanabara Bay. You can see that the city is literally growing into some of these last protected areas. And so, so much of the economic development is based on exploitation um, and de degradation of, of the landscape. So we need to come up with solutions that people can have livelihoods while also protecting the forest. And there's a growing movement of ecotourism of, especially the pandemic really pushed a lot of people into biking and hiking. And so the idea of this trail that we've actually begun this year um, is to, to map the areas that are degraded, work with the local community members, create this trail together, it's community-based. And in these six months that we've started it, so many people have been have mobilized. There are so many trail guides who are interested, who are already working in this area. And the idea is also to create a new market for agroforestry and agroecological products, because a lot of landowners in this area have potential or already are growing food, but the market is so small. So imagine these places like the Camino de Santiago where you have millions of people passing by. We're not gonna have millions of people, but you have tourists that value visitors and researchers and students that value this kind of food and production. Then you create a new market for these landowners. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and these are just a few pictures of uh, us mapping, working with the local uh, local people, the local uh, trail guides and um, uh, local leaders to map the land. So I actually did three days of the trail. The total trail will be probably 15 days. So I've done three of the days um, working with the local park managers and government agents um, to see how this trail can actually be a really community based and really have an impact for restoration. Next slide. So since this is about careers and this is about um, what does my life look like now, um, I chose these two photos because I think it shows both aspects of my life. Um, I have one part of my life that is the adventurous part that I always dreamed of when I was graduating from college, which is the getting my hands dirty, working in the agroforest, doing the courses, doing the mapping. Um, I've mapped so many different uh, land uh, properties in the region and the and the, the trail itself, um, and really that hands-on part that I love. And, you know, I live, I live at Sinal. It's a, it's a small community where there's um, about 10 or 15 of us who live on the property. So I'm surrounded by nature and forest all the time. 
But then I have the other part, um, which is also to me very exciting is the part where we're getting to do conferences, project management, international conferences. Um, I feel really lucky because my director, Thais, is you know very grassroots, but she is also internationally known. She's a Brazilian entrepreneur and a leader who, in the field of sustainability and feminism for the last 35 years. So I've also gotten to meet incredible people. Um, so we're always trying to do that bridge of like the global to local um, all different levels. And I work with a really cool team, mostly women, <laughs> um, of people from around the world, but also mo mostly Brazilian as well. Um, so that's been a really important part for, for my life. Why I've stayed here so long is I have, you know, this amazing group of people that I work and live with. And yeah, from now looking forward, I mean, I never imagined I was going to stay seven years in Brazil. Um, every year my parents are like, so are you coming back this year? Are you coming back this year? But, you know, I've ended up finding so much meaning and purpose uh, in my life and in my career that I realize how that is so valuable. And of course, there are many challenges for the future. Um, it's when you have a career that's so different and not a straight line, of course, there's a lot of unknown. Um, but I feel like I have learned or I'm learning to, to be comfortable with the unknown. And, and every time I followed my intuition and put an intention, things have always kind of worked out. I didn't really know why I was coming to Brazil. I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I discovered this place that is so aligned with, um, with, with what I believe in. So I would say, uh, I would say that, that, you know, there's, there are many challenges but I have ended up found finding a, a place that is able to combine so many different aspects of, of my interest and, um, and what I said that Sinal is a very integrative place. So that was really important for me to be in a place like this. So yeah, I guess that's kind of, I will open up questions after, um, but I'm, I'm really happy to talk more about my personal career or things that we do at Sinal. Um, and yeah. And thank you again also just for the invitation. The Ecosystem Restoration Camps has been an amazing partner for us. We joined last year and they're an amazing network. So I'm really happy for the invitation and to be able to participate um, with you all. Thank you so much, Katie. Wow, that sounds like an incredible project. And we're getting, you have some amazing enthusiasm as well in both the chat and our questions are, thank you for sharing. What a cool story. And now I would love to pass the mic on over to Ronald Flores. Hello. Oh, well, uh, Katie, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and just bringing some more depth about what you guys are doing. And I'm so glad to see that uh, John, Lou and yourself and all the people in your network are actually doing the work. Um, so I just took a couple of notes that just make me smile because you mentioned it. Uh, you mentioned hippies, right? And uh, and I call myself a pretty pragmatic hippie. Um, how how is this, right? So then, let me introduce myself. So I'm Renaud Flores, and uh, I'm French, and I'm the owner and the CEO and the founder of Florescence System. So our job, our mission, is to provide uh, actual operational solution for farmers and mostly at large scale. Uh, to transition their, let's say, conventional agricultural system into um, regenerative. Uh, why regenerative? I guess def defining what regenerative is in the context. Uh, what, what does that? Why does that make sense? Just because by the conventional method itself, we have probably degenerated. We have kind of uh, used up all the saving accounts that we had in once upon a time in the soil. So before being sustainable, we need to regenerate. That's what we're doing. Uh, next slide, please. So um, yeah, transitioning, as I was mentioning, um, we are providing those uh, solutions. Uh, why uh, such an offer? Because um, farmers all over the world have learned um, the conventional way so far, and they haven't learned what we can uh, call uh, ecosystem thinking. And for us, it starts uh, at soil level. Next slide, please. So we are based, uh, we have two companies. Uh, one is in Switzerland, 
because of uh, my earliest uh, career and now the second company is uh, is in peru uh, peru is also one of the big countries producing a lot of food all for all over the world and as katie was mentioning here as well in peru you have a lot of what people call superfood available here at the corner next slide please um so engaging a step further of, of why are we doing um, work on soil i like this quote of janine benius she's the the leader of the biomimicry institute uh, which which talks about just observe natural ecosystems uh, in order to create uh, other human systems for the human uh, benefit so yes 90, if 99% of the of the, of the living species on earth are smaller than a bumblebee we'd better take a look at it in order to try to understand what's going on next slide please so um now engaging a, a step further uh, in what we actually provide in order to have this uh, regeneration happening or, I mean, on the um, uh, eco, uh, eco, ecosystem re restoration camps, you guys use the restoration, we use regeneration. Uh, so, but for us, it's a real uh, synonymous. So what we do, we have like four main blocks, which is applying the scientific um, uh, methods, experience, knowledge that uh, we've learned through the Soil Food Web School through Elaine. This has opened to us to a, a massive uh, new uh, uh, horizon and panora panorama, if I may say. Uh, so based on that, we provide then uh, either just simple soil health services, which is like looking at the soil and telling you about your soil health, which we believe is now more and more uh, meaningful uh, i got i just recently contacted by a a i think it's a it's a it's a ngo who is buying i don't know how many hectares of land and and he wanted to know uh the quality of his soil health which is not provided as of today in the normal mainstream labs right uh, so it says that there is now a growing interest from people buying land knowing what is the state of their soil health anyway so that we provide that too on the side of this we also provide skills right we want to have the farmers become self-sustainable in managing their own system we want the farmers to be their own scientists their own detective so they can be or go away from what the conventional agriculture has created. I mean think about it guys um, those of you who are farmers know that every year you have a massive invoice for your chemis your chemical your minerals your uh, phyto sanitary program fungicide etc cetera, etc cetera. so for us regenerating is also helping the farmer to be self sustainable and to know how to do that so we provide those uh, capacity development uh, services and the last one we we are working on uh, taking over project to actually uh deploy the the transition on land with farmers <clears throat> sorry who uh, this is where it's kind of painful for, with farmers who are actually keen on uh, spending some of their uh money in transitioning their system so those who have understood that you know we the one who's feeding her us is mother hers and so if we don't care if we don't invest now to balance the past decades investment in destroying the land well we are maybe gone from that planet so that's what we do next slide please um so yeah providing um an understanding that uh well that no right that was that one <laughs> that was sorry one. team there we go <laughs> yes so yeah change change we have to be uh, um an active um, part of it. Uh, I think Katie was mentioning the change actors or something like this. Um, what, the way we do it uh, is also acknowledging that we are all in, in, in transition or in evolution or in some sort of growth. Next slide, please. And that that's, that's kind of, I'm going to show 
a couple of pictures here um, that may tell you I mean, this is what my life was like when I was uh, before starting to do some soil regeneration. So those who kind of um, have uh, experience in this kind of realm, uh, I was working in Switzerland in private banking. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so that, that experience was key for me to understand the reality. I was looking at my screens and, and I was looking outside to what was not being done. And so I just, one day, seven years, seven, eight years ago, I just packed my backpack and just decided to follow my intuition, my dreams, my kids' dreams. Um, I wanted to discover the world and 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 from, and next slide, please. And uh, and, and on, on that road, I, I had decided to just look at food, right? So I took my backpack and I started to volunteer uh, Next slide, please. Uh, within three main institutions that some people of you know. So then I've started by permaculture, uh, volunteering here and there. And then I embarked with the um, uh, Savory Institute people, holistic management, so regenerative grazing. And on that road, what happened is just like those people from the Savory Institute regenerating land at a big scale, they were all talking about soil and this is like oh the most powerful tool that we have to regenerate soil is the soil community soil microbiology and no one was really talk i mean providing solutions for that and thanks to these people from the Saver institute i remember a couple of years ago they invited dr ingham on a on, on on their live webinar i mean face to face physical web webinar i mean uh, meeting in london and uh, she she became one of the light in my tunnel. Next slide, please. So she put the idea of all that together, permaculture, uh, regenerative grazing and soil microbiology uh, got me the idea of ecosystem, which means it's all interconnected from the soil to what we eat, to what we do. Um, it's all about ecosystem and from that ecosystem, understanding it became what we call at florescent system it's called ecosystem thinking and from the thinking how do we can apply that so yeah again janine uh, benius here uh, mentions this interactive uh, thing that nature does and as of today next slide please we need we really need to just cooperate so another part of the inspiration has been uh, for me to realize what was really going on on the field. So on the right side of that picture, you see um, a man loading his prayer with some funny liquid and he's wearing a gas mask. Um, it was really concerning for me when I first just actually faced that and wearing a fast my face mask for very nasty toxic product reminded me of what are we doing on the other side on a more military side of things you can see that both of those people wear the same gas mask right so that was one source of inspiration how do we make the difference so then these people kind of actually stop wearing those masks but also thinking i mean we are growing that food we are and then who's eating that food okay so that was one source of inspiration for us next slide please on the top of uh, the rest of the conversation with this kind, next slide, please. With this kind of pictures, uh, okay, the things are changing around this. Uh, like here, well, the megafauna probably disappeared for some whatever, anthropo or anthropo ethno reason. Next slide, please. And taking that road, <clears throat> traveling and just working and then figuring out, talking with people, realizing that as well, I mean, the earliest settlers had other different, you know, practices and conditions about the land. And this was many, 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 many different kinds of um, living beings would that be plants or animals. Next slide, next slide, please. On that road, one of the main um the key the key element for us at fluorescent system is understanding that this change has happened through agriculture you we can think about this first nomad that just like uh discovered or thought that just like by putting a seed in the soil you would have tenfold or 100 fold 100 time 
uh, more yield that kind of next slide please that made us settle we became settlers we have changed the way we impact our ecosystems you can see on this kind of uh, uh, painting that here there we are next to river water on the back on the back side of the picture you have forests you have animal here you have fields here this is what we've done and so within this understanding of uh, okay we've settled what have we what have we done next slide please um <clears throat> Um, it's about how do we care for the land with the animal? Next slide, please. How do we actually work the land? Uh, which means from manual to the competition of who has the biggest uh, tractor, the biggest the, the, the biggest horsepower to work the more land, right? Uh, next slide, please. And it all comes back for us to soil. Regenerating, next slide, please, is taking care, looking at, how the ecosystem works in soil. We are we are specializing in that, which means like how do we apply that to the farmer so we can create uh, agricultural food systems that are first regenerating to feeding humans on a healthy way. Next slide, please. So where where did all start? It? I mean, ne and next slide, please. The whole starting point was in Sweden. Um, we had been I mean, in our network, we have some people and they, there was this um, two actors, garden mar market garden producers, and they were organic, but they had a lot of problem of pests. And so they asked us if we could just um, uh, try to work it out. And so we came over with uh, our techniques of uh, microbiologically uh, loaded compost and then compost extract and compost tea. Next slide, please. And uh, and the first year we achieved, uh, we achieved a beautiful result by applying what we've learned uh, through uh, Dr. Ingham Soil Food Web School. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So how did that how did that make a difference for us? Well, we enjoyed that that uh, that experience to write a, a scientific uh, um, investigation that uh, Dr. Ingham read, and then at that time her, her colleague read a doctor a colleague read it again, and by having wrote that, we published it, and then we 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 could have more uh, visibility uh, with all the network the people. Um, are willing to do the change in agriculture. So then we got just contacted more and more. Next slide, please. So what does that, what our day-to-day -day look like? Well, um, it's about making it. So next slide, please. It's about going in the field. It's about observing. It's about being there. It's about testing it. Here, uh, I'm standing in a, in the oilseed rape field uh, that we have tried with the, <clears throat> with the organic methods that we have next slide please and and then on the same time we we organize a uh, large scale production for compost making we we know that uh, by you know the compost making is is the actually saving account that we have been uh, using up for uh, as long as conventional agriculture is next slide please uh, we do it at large scale, you will see here on the left, these are big, big, big wind rows on, on this farm in Latvia. We are working on 5,000 hectares. And on the right side, you can see that we can do that on the harshest conditions. We are close to Latvia. So close to uh, Russia, excuse me. Next slide, please. So we make it work. We have the experience. And that's what is about making it real. Also, we are uh, engaging with our client farmers to, you know, develop the infrastructures to produce uh, compost tea, compost extract, it's kind of a, a nearly industrial way. Um, we are designing that with our clients, we're adapting it to their context, and it takes the whole uh, operational supply chain. So next slide, please. Um, but most importantly, when we have reached that, um, we want to we wanna transfer that back into the field. So then we're using the existing tools right here. Uh, it's, a, it's a picture taken with a big sprayer fully loaded with a microbiological life. 
and we are uh, making sure that this biology goes back to the soil so then restarting the soil ecosystem next slide please it's a lot of hurdles it's a lot of challenges but this is what we do we also engage on, on the next steps of all the farming operations here. We can look at a, a mulcher, so which is uh, mulching from the permaculture side applied at large scale here. And um, so we engage with the machinery producer, designer, engineers to make sure that with the one work that we provide on the microbiological level it also it's supported by the machinery that they use because we have to use the tools that are existing and also innovate a little bit this machine for example is has now been turned into a cedar mulcher after you harvest the microbiology is in the soil already you have the seeding that is pushing the cover crop already which is also sustaining the the the, so, the whole uh, basics of soil ecosystem next slide please so we engage at that level too and also um we're training people so then on our work is microbiology but also engaging on how people can own that so then they become the proprietary of all this knowledge that we are we've been uh, we've been so lucky to have through uh, the soil food web uh, uh, school so then from the agronomist uh, to the kids to any other uh, people who wants to actually regenerate the soil, we are uh, providing two solutions face to face, or uh, we have a really hands on uh, video online classes program that we are dedicated to farmers. So because farmers needs real hands on solutions. Next slide, please. And also, um, like more i mean a couple of months ago we i engaged into a phd so that kind of a, a kind of semi artistic way of looking at what i was trying to uh, to uh, to study and resolve um so that's kind of the whole kind of background of uh, what we're doing next slide please so it's about uh, yes regenerating ecosystems and soils ecosystem because we do believe that I mean, we have maybe seven, eight, nine billions on Earth, and the majority of the food. I mean, there is at least a twenty percent of that food which is produced on in developed countries with big machines and and all that. So we need to tackle this twenty percent. This is really our goal. Um, so yes, I, now we're working in Sweden. Uh, when we worked in Sweden, okay, it was a little too fast, but they, keep it, uh, Adrian, that's nice. No, no, keep it, keep it, it's okay. Uh, we're working in Spain, we're working in Austria, now we're engaging um, in Honduras and Nicaragua with tobacco growers. I mean, we're actually flying over there uh, uh, next, this Saturday. So, yes, it's about looking, I mean, making us, um, I mean, figuring out what's the state of of the art of of what we do today in terms of human communities and their food systems we're looking at what we have today but where we're going tomorrow it's about the next generations and how they will be able you know to sustain their lives in relationship with the one who feed us mother hers um for me uh, for us at fluorescent system it's just like uh, it's a mission we do it because it it anim it's it makes us feel animated um we it's a real the truth is like yes there's a lot of challenges but it makes i mean if i compare my life today as as i was in the private banking i'm way more happy but also i see the changes i see people around me uh the farmers that i work to just starting to study more microbiology or go to cover crop or to go to agroforestry and i see the change it makes me feel good because and hopeful really so yes i mean now we can talk i can just also bring it back to some very let's say pragmatic uh, questions like am i supposed to make uh, how i mean am i doing am, am i earning a reasonable amount of money so i can do i can just keep going and and not go back to finance the, the answer is yes it's absolutely yes there is a, a growing a growing demand people are i mean i, I received three four um, emails per week asking me for giving a budget quote quotes about how much would that be for that service and, and that service personally um my quality of life is is is, is good I'm, i mean i'm i'm I, i'm a kind of a nomad 
traveler sometimes and i mean i can work and travel and look at the, the diversity of ecosystems and how do people do the do the um, do they <clears throat> do this transition uh, next slide please so in terms of hopes yes i'm 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 really I mean hopeful that we can turn uh, dirt into soil, which means from a dead matter to a, a life matter, which is a, which is what planet Earth does. I mean, she's alive. Mother Earth is alive. She's providing the food, the shelters, all the material that we need. Um, and so that that's my hopes. And the next slide, please. Uh, and 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 also <clears throat> coming to a day when. I have to, I would be able to stop what I'm doing because most farmers would be doing the work because they would have all the necessary knowledge and capacities and, and vision to actually do them the, to themselves. So that's kind of one of the hopes. Um, now, what would I say uh, to someone who would love to just, you know, be a part of that? Next slide, please. Is that um, the more the merrier we need we need more people doing the actual job really so that's kind of that's kind of it next slide please and then and the and the last one is just like yeah join just go take the walk take the walk on the wild side if you like but yes that's uh that's what we can share in terms of like restoring a soil ecosystem thank you You're muted, Adrian. Right, you're, you're muted, but I feel like we just got cued. <laughs> we did. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Renal. That was beautiful. Thank you, Keisha and Casey. Come on in. Welcome back. Yay. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming today. It's always crazy to see the numbers. 278 people out there watching. That's really cool. Um, you know, what I'm noticing is really neat about Katie and Renal's stories is just how they really... Um, are a reflection of our path as well. Although we all came from different places and different backgrounds, um, permaculture, Alan Savory's, you know, pasture work, and then biology, like that was, that was our path as well. Um, and so now we're, we're compost producers. Uh, we've been doing that for about five years now. Uh, Catalyst Bio Amendments is still, you know, fully functioning, up and running, selling compost. Um, and in the past few years, Casey and I have started a new company, Catalyst Biological Solutions, where we go out and we think of ourselves as training wheels. We're helping farmers to implement soil food web techniques, make their own compost on site, um, even using microscopes and, and kind of just slowly but surely over time showing them how to do what we do until they don't need our help anymore. So, um, you know, our job has really changed over time from just being very compost focused to now, you know, we're kind of wrapping back around to our permaculture background. Next slide, Adrian. So yeah, I guess where we got started, how we got into it, like Keisha said, is very similar to um, Katie and uh, Renald is, you know, we, we were in the United States and we were kind of working on, kind of working on farms, not really, just kind of traveling around, not really knowing what we're doing. And we decided, hey, we're going to go to Ecuador. And yeah, we ended up going to Ecuador and we ended up living there for seven years as well, Katie. <laughs> um, so very, very similar in that regard. Um, we put a lot of energy into like it, this farm that you're seeing right here was um, actually like three miles from the closest road. So everything we had up there, we brought in on horseback and it was a land regeneration project, uh, kind of trying to reforest this small mountainside in Ecuadorian Andes. Um, but yeah, that's where we kind of got really interested in this stuff. We started learning about permaculture. Uh, we raised goats um, and there was no like, hey, you can't go to the store and buy hay while we're there. So all the goats were raised off just what we could grow on the land. And so we were very into rotational grazing, um, which is kind of then that segue into the soil food web school that Ronaldo's even talking about. It's very similar paths. Um, we in the natural building, um, that building on the left there is like a house that we built, um, you know, did the entire thing by hand and really plastered the whole thing with natural plasters. And this, this is kind of that intro into what's going on in the soil, like where, you know, really digging our hands in and getting really familiar with growing things. Yeah, when we were there, it was, it was interesting, I guess, not surprising, but um, there wasn't a great composting program when we got there. And that was really where 
I started to get um, involved. And I remember the first time we did the tour here, the guy Eve Zender that started this project is a wealth of knowledge. Um, we didn't know about permaculture at all. I remember walking around and just thinking like, how could one person have this much information on how to move succession along from bare ground to a forest? And you know, through time, we gathered all that information and became those people that were giving the tours and became those people who were teaching. And it was really that composting program that sparked the soil food web, web micro obsession. Um, because it was just, it was really apparent to us that sometimes the soil was producing food that we weren't even supposed to be able to grow. This is very high elevation country um, in the Andes. And so things like, you know, spinach and tomatoes, like they're not really doing well at that elevation in the soil quality. Uh, next slide. And so it was, you know, we would have 12 to 15 people up on this mountain. We're doing everything on horseback. And so you can imagine food scarcity becomes a thing if everybody just eats everything they want to and we have to bring everything up it's almost impossible so one of our biggest goals was to grow as much food as possible as we could there and so it's interesting because like when we did this i don't think we knew we were becoming part of a mission um, it was more a goal in our head to understand how we could influence our surroundings and our water systems, our buildings, our, you know, absolutely everything is kind of catered to us in the country that we live in now. And so when we were put into this um, sort of situation, suddenly we're, we're, we're the owners of our water systems. We're the one that are, you know, creating, you know, if a water is going to flow into a tap, we were the ones to make that happen. If we were to, you know, want to have flour and you know corn, we had to grow that. And so um, we started the soil food web classes while we were up there. And then interestingly enough, being off grid, the microscope work like it just didn't vibe with it. Um, and the distance between town was prohibitive for doing soil sampling or you know getting anything done um, quickly. <laughs> so that was kind of our segue out of Ecuador was actually diving into the soil food web school. And it's just like, yeah, you actually need a little bit of first world, I guess you could say, like <laughs> amenities in order to have your microscope, have a microscope lab and do that kind of stuff. So that's when we decided to come back to the United States. Next slide. Um, and kind of get our start into the Soil Food Web School. We went back um, for uh, a, a class that Elaine was teaching. Um, we were supposed to be coming back for a couple months um, to the US. Um, took the class with Elaine and then just basically dove head first straight into the Soil Food Web School and just never went back to Ecuador. I haven't been back since. Um, yeah, it was also, it was interesting at that class, we were suddenly in a community of people that were as crazy about microbes and composting as we were. And, you know, that was the first experience we ever had being in microbe community. And, and so it was just suddenly all these people were buzzing, we're excited, we're talking, we're realizing like there's no good compost on the market in bulk. And after hand turning, you know, six piles to graduate the Soil Food Web School, we had enough and realized that um, if we were just to use our bodies, it wasn't going to work. And so that was actually the class right there is Zach in the background. It was the class where we met our business partners and it was insane how quickly uh, catalyst bio amendments became a, a reality you know we were all sitting down and at, at the time like e eva schneider was the big teacher at the school she was the only one and we were in her house all sitting on the floor just so excited about how we were gonna you know make this compost lot we're like we're gonna turn shit into gold and you know what it, <laughs> what the gold ended up being wasn't money it was this community it was this um this mission that we're all on, this these interactions that we get to have in the work, it was uh, it was not the profit that I thought we would get from the whole experience. Uh, we gained so much from just being involved with these groups and watching this dream come to life. Next slide. And so this is where we started. This is how we started, where we started our business. Um, we were, we're in Nevada City, so it's really hilly. It's kind of in the foothills. And we were looking for somewhere flat that was, you know, we didn't want to take something that was super nice and like bulldoze it out and make a freaking compost pad. Um, so on the left here, you can see this is like the day we took over the lease of the space. And in that right side area right there, this pasture had just been completely overgrazed by uh, sheep and cattle. They basically left them in these fields all year long. Um, so there was basically nothing growing in this top right corner here. So that's why we decided we took over this space and that's where we decided to put our uh, composting pad in there. 
And you can see like the on the right hand side up in the top, that's after one year of just kind of treating it with a little bit of extract and a little bit of um, compost tea, we were able to like bring what was actually had grass growing back into reality um, or back into thriving. Um, yeah, and what was really exciting about this is this is a Quaker school. They've been a social justice school for over 60 years. Um, they care, uh, uh, organic agriculture is like at the top of their list of important things. Um, and it was just some renters that hadn't managed the property correctly that put it in the state. But there's also a very old orchard, there's a community garden, and um, they've been really open to us doing our work there and just kind of showcasing over time what you can do in a pasture system using microbes to regenerate everything. And, you know, through the years, we've, um, we've had a lot of ups and downs at the, at the farm. We had a big fire one year, which ended up just, you know, destroying the pastures again. And what was amazing was to see such destruction and devastation after the fire and then watch, like, how quickly it rebounds. I mean, it was uh, almost instantaneous after we got another rain after the fire, those microbes just boom, shot back into action and went to work. Um, and so, yeah, just this, this prime location and the fact that it was readily available for us the second we asked is just mind blowing. We've been looking for a second location for years and they're not easy to come by. <laughs> so um, our permit, our, our compost lot is now officially fully permitted with the water board, with the city, we are full compost lot. So we are really proud of this project. Next slide. So our, our, our daily lives, like what, what is it that we do now? Like, what does our job look like? Um, you know, it started with the composting lot and now a lot of what we do is outreach, um, just kind of trying to put microbes in front of people's faces so they can see the unseeable, basically. Um, this is actually us at a um, customer appreciation day at, the, at a, uh, a store that sells our product. And we, you know, we put our compost up on the, <laughs> thanks Adrian for the highlights. Uh, we put our compost up on the microscope so people can see it. And then we also encourage people to bring in their own samples um, so they can like see it in person on a screen, see what's going on in their comp or in their soil. Um, and it was really cool. Um, this person in particular has been using our compost um, and then they brought in a soil sample and we were actually seeing a lot of the same microorganisms in their soil that we were seeing in our compost. And so it was just really, like, really cool to, you know, let people see that, like, what they're doing actually is, is working and actually moving forward. Right, it was literally like, I was like, is this our compost? Or no, it's just soil. And it was a totally different texture from the compost. It really looked like, you know, dark clay or something like this. Um, and it is like so much of our mission when we started, the mission was like, can we make good compost at scale? That was our total stress point all the time. Um, but now we know, like, reliably, yes, we can do it. Um, it's not that difficult. All you have to do is pay attention. And now it's it's really the mission is moved towards creating community around composting, creating community around, around microorganisms and regenerative work. Um, we put a lot of effort into making it fun, making it understandable, making it um, you know, something that people want to do because it is laborious. You know, if you really look at what our job is, it's a lot of um, using a pitchfork to move organic materials from one place to another. <laughs> uh, we spend a lot of time holding a hose. We spend a lot of time just you know, watering plants and it can get dull. <laughs> so, um, you know, just a huge part of the mission at this point is to, you know, love the team, bring people on and enjoy our community while we do the work. Next slide. <clears throat> and yeah, it's almost every, almost everywhere we go now. It's us with the screen and people. Um, it's just over and over and over again. This is what gets people excited. This is what makes them want to do the work. And this is what makes them believe that it's real. So it's like we're working with invisible forces. And I think that's a huge barrier with our work is you just can't see it. You want to believe it. And then when you do, it's so painfully obvious. Yeah, so um, with this is we are teaching workshops as well. It's another asset or aspect of our job. Uh, next slide. And but we also go out and we consult with large scale farms as well. Um, this is a 2000 acre uh, strawberry farm um, in Salinas Valley. Um, and they're already organic, but they kind of contacted us looking into how can they start even cutting back on possibly even their organic nutrients um, and slowly start building their soil over time. It, it's pretty incredible. They're in this island, their, their strawberry farm is an island surrounded by conventional agriculture with like thousands of like hundreds of acres on every side 
Um, but you could see um, they had been slowly implementing these techniques for a year. And the color of their soil, like on this road line right here, on one side of it, it has a start, slight dark hue. And on the other side, it is completely white. And it's, you know, nature doesn't put soil in that way on straight lines. So you can see that it's actually having a, a positive effect on the soil. Yeah, it's a, and those those strawberries are just delicious. The, <laughs> those had been cut up after their, I think, first and second treatment with microbes. But what's so cool about this is like these strawberries go into boxes and they go all over the U.S. Some of these strawberries went to New York. Some of them go to Wisconsin and they go to they go to Safeway. They go to, you know, normal stores where normal people shop. It's not like it's necessarily a co-op or some special you know, high-end organic store. These are just your basic strawberries that go out to everyone. And uh, it's just so cool to know that there's farmers that are making the switch. And I'll also drop a note just because it's a cute story. Um, those poppies right there, they started to put in flowers around the rows to try to, you know, increase their pollinators, make uh, more habitat. And um, their workers, the, actually the, the farm manager, his farm manager really loved what they were doing. And every day when he walks by those flowers, he picks the seed pods off and saves them. So all those flowers are last year's flowers that were hand collected and saved by the people that work there. And so it's just, you know, that's like another added bonus is instead of walking around and spraying chemicals in full plastic suits, sweating to death, uh, the people that work there, they don't have to wear protective suits. They walk around and pick flower seeds all day. So, <laughs> you know, this is, uh, it's really cool for everybody that's involved. Next slide. Oh, this is another part of our job. And, and this is, again, the microscope set up in a really weird place. That's like a shack in the middle of a field somewhere. Um, but what's cool about this image is um, a farmer from across the street, a conventional farmer, they just put pesticides on their soil and they were looking at the microbes um, in the screen and he quickly was, can I go grab a plant? Can I? Can I bring it over and put it under the microscope? Well, let's look at it. These weird, like the, the white circle there is that it's a lack, like there's nothing there. And those spots are all over the sample. And you can see the bacteria actually edging away from it and vibrating at the edge, like no go zone. And so it was interesting just to show them like the lack of, you know, everything in that system. <laughs> Hopefully they convert over to organic soon. You want to see that? No. Next slide. Um, and as far as our contribution, you know, uh, uh, we, we've spent a lot of time um, actually because we have been victims of a fire um, at our composting lot. Um, we've gone out and done a lot of uh, fire restoration um, as well as like fire mitigation, trying to mitigate runoff um, from burn sites. So we actually donated a bunch of compost. Um, this one was in Santa Cruz, I believe, uh, Keisha on the left there. Um, and made a bunch of compost socks so that we could actually and put it around any of the house sites to kind of catch and filter any of those toxic chemicals and heavy metals and things that kind of that flow out of uh, recent recently burned houses. Yeah, it's actually good to note um, this was before we burned down. We oh, didn't boy. start helping yep. with fires because we burned down. <laughs> unfortunately it just came for us eventually <laughs> but in our area that is that's like that's the trial of everyone in california is it's almost everyone i know is burned down at least once um and it happens so frequently and in such uh large numbers that the state can't get in and help people mitigate their toxic runoff before the rains come and this is actually an ecosystem regeneration camp that we got to be invited to be a part of so you know, this work with the ecosystem regeneration camps has been close to our hearts since the very beginning. Um, our very first year, that was the first time we were able to be of service to a larger community was um, with the fires. And so, you know, it's, um, this work is, 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 is really, um, I guess it, it fills my heart up because it's, you know, whether we're volunteering or we're making money or we're, just out at a party talking too much about microbes to some random person, you see the effect of what you do because this is something that translates to people. Um, and it's starting to become more and more that folks are aware of, you know, even if they don't know about soil microbes, they know that there's a problem and that we need to come up with a solution and that there's not a lot of people, you know, in the in the government or in, and no one's out there telling us what to do, right? And so this kind of work is incredible because you can, you can, um, learn how to take it upon yourself to change these big issues that are right in front of you. And so, you know, we're not like setting out to change the world. We're setting out to change our area right here. And what's really exciting is when people come into that sphere and are, are, are affected by it, you see them changing their little part of the world. And so, you know, bit by bit, um, we see a huge difference. 
Um, it's hard to think of it globally all at once, but I, I believe it's happening. Next. <laughs> Do we make enough money? That was the question. Do we make enough money? Uh, yeah, yeah, we make enough money. <laughs> it's live, not, it's we, our highest paying job that we've ever had, to be honest. But God, it's a good job. <laughs> it's fun, you know, like, so this is that just we, we live in a yurt. Um, so it's, you know, we are kind of nomadic people. We've moved to this yurt like halfway <laughs> across California, down to LA. Four or five times. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, it's, you know, it's like this job is, we're not going to be flying around in compost one, you know, our, our brand new jet anytime soon, but you know, it does, <laughs> it does provide, like it, it is what we live off. It is what we do. And it is, it does support us. It does support our lifestyle and what we want. So that was interesting. We just spent, um, I know John Lou's out there right now listening, but we just got to spend four days with him and just blissfully hanging out on the porch and talking about, you know, what is value? And like, is it money? Um, certainly we need money to exist in you know today's paradigm. I spend money all the time, but um, there's other value to this. And it's like, you know, the the people that we are surrounded by, like I am yet to meet a micro person that I don't like. And I know that might be, you know, tempting fate there, but like really, 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 <laughs> I, I haven't. They're all good people. Um, and it's, you know, we're well fed. We get to travel to really cool places. We get in, invited to spots that we would never, ever, ever be able to go if it wasn't for the fact that you know, we're doing this work. So beyond the money, I mean, there's value in this lifestyle and it's seemingly endless um, as we can tell. Next slide. Next slide. So the next question was about work-life balance. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> I think that we, our work-life balance, it's really hard for me as I'm looking through my photos to tell where my, where my work ends and where the fun begins. Um, all of it is very much webbed together. Um, each one of these pictures is us in a different location. Even at our wedding, we took sales calls on compost. No joke, you guys. I woke up the day after my wedding and sold two yards of compost. Um, and everybody that was at our <laughs> wedding was compost people. <laughs> our rings have microbes on them. It's become this, uh, like, we're immersed in it. It's it's our full entire life. And yeah, it can be so overwhelming sometimes to just not have a classic business model. The way we operate isn't anything like what we've been taught. Um, it doesn't look like what other jobs look like. We share information openly. We work with our competition to try to help their products get better. We, I don't know, this is just a different way of going about things that we do not have figured out yet. You know, I would love a business plan that's like locked down just like the Soil Food Web operates, but <laughs> like you probably know, we don't know so much about how the Soil Food Web really operates to like, you know, business model it out yet. <laughs> But um, yeah, there's not really a lot of lines. It's all fuzzy and we're always having fun. We're always trying to make the best of it and always trying to pull you know, a little vacation out of every single job we do. So um, you know, if you're a person that's wanting to get into this and you wanna make it your entire life, like all we do is micro work. We don't have any other jobs. Um, remember diversity. You wanna do a lot of stuff to be able to make sure that you always have something to fall back on when things are changing because you know right now we don't really know what the future is going to look like and it's probably a lot better than we're imagining so <laughs> just going to keep on keeping on I guess I would add to the work-life balance is people say it's like if you love your job you'll never work a day in your life and it's like <laughs> the total not true if you love your job you'll work every single day of your life <laughs> so it's kind of into that work-life balance but yeah next slide um, and I guess just like hopes, hopes for us um, on our business going forward. Um, that guy you're seeing on the left there is our very first employee, my very first employee I've ever had. Um, but yeah, we, I, I think our hopes is, you know, to expand, expand our business, um, be able to provide more for our employee, be able to invite and in, have more employees and kind of make more of a, you know, a, a not just having a larger business, but having a, like a place where we can, you know, help people, bring people into this, have them start teaching other people and just kind of expand this out. Um, on the right there is our, is our new spray rig. That's another, our, our, another hope for us is to kind of expand that business. Um, and just, you know, we've been doing a lot of landscape and stuff down here in LA, which I think is like really cool. I mean, agriculture is definitely like the biggest industry. But, you know, it's cool that people even are starting to see this now in their own front yards, like quite literally in their own front yards. They're seeing that these chemicals like, 
you know, they see the guy walking through their yard with a mask on and they are like, what is going on here? Why am I poisoning my front porch? You know, so it's really cool to see this kind of moving forward and um, yeah, just the progression. Yeah, it was, it's thinking about that, like what, you know, what, what future hopes were and it's, it's just come to be a realization of mine that, yeah, the business we started could absolutely like we can hire 50 people and 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 wouldn't it be cool if if they made enough money to buy houses in, in this day and age with house prices where they are so you know that's the goal like i want to see the people that are around us thriving in this um and 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 creating their own realities because like we just we never have all the good ideas so you know growing the team um making it a good place to work for ourselves and for everyone we hire and um, just thriving on, you know, that community mindset, like that's, that's the goal for the future. We'll see where we're at next webinar. We'll update you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the last slide. I think you are right. Oh my goodness, you two. Thank you so much. And, you know, before we pop in to Q&A all together, um, you know, it's just so beautiful to see again and again in all of your stories how, to me, regenerating soil also means regenerating smiles and picking flowers and all of these community building elements. There's always a people. And I know Nicole Masters in For the Love of Soil says that humans put the culture in agriculture. And I, I really see that in all, all three of those stories that I just heard from, from all y'all. So um, does, that, does that feel true to what it means to regenerate soil regenerate soil regenerate culture <laughs> beautiful well thanks team okay so before we launch into our q a to bring all of these discussions together i am just again so thrilled to get to announce our new partnership between the soil food web school and ecosystem restoration camps um, it's just an, a phenomenal opportunity for folks to take Elaine's incredibly synthesized view of ecology that is rooted in scientific and all sorts of wisdom, as well as then applying that to ecosystem scale, thinking about forests and rivers and coral reefs and expanding out our notion of what it means to regenerate, to restore. So with that, um, I have a brief video to share with us um, to sit back, relax and enjoy. If you are looking for a way to make a big, positive impact on the environment, the Ecosystem Restoration Bundle could be for you. Whether you're a farmer or agricultural professional looking for a way to transition to regenerative ag without harming profits, or someone looking for an impactful new career as a soil food web consultant, lab tech, or compost producer, or if you're someone who is really passionate about ecosystem restoration, this bundle has a lot to offer you. We've put together four really powerful tools that will set you up for success, enabling you to make an impact on the soils and ecosystems in your part of the world. Tool number one, the Soil Food Web Foundation courses. This is where you'll learn all about how soil functions on a biological level. You'll understand what the four key groups of microorganisms are and how they work together with plants, nurturing and protecting them. You'll learn how to make biological compost and liquid soil amendments and how to apply them to soil so that the soil biome can be rapidly restored to health. These are all great skills to have at your disposal if you are working on regenerating farmland or an ecosystem restoration project, as repairing the soil biome will dramatically accelerate the regeneration process so you can start to see the results in the first growing season. Tool number two. The Introduction to Ecosystem Restoration. This is where you'll study ecological principles and ecosystem restoration techniques. This course will prepare you to make a meaningful contribution to any ecosystem restoration camp where people are coming together to restore their landscapes. Please take a look at the Pathways video for more information on this. This is a great tool to have in your box if you are a soil food web consultant working with farmers to support their transition to regenerative agriculture because it will empower you to have a positive effect on the wider ecosystem beyond the soil biome and cropland. You'll be able to have a positive impact on streams and rivers, on woodlands, and on the animals that occupy the local area too. Tool number three, the Certified Lab Tech Program, 
This is an intensive three-month program designed to help you to master Dr. Lane's microscopy technique. You'll work one-on-one -on -one with a microscopy mentor in eight one-hour sessions. This is such a powerful tool because it enables you to measure the success of various techniques that you might be experimenting with on your own ecosystem restoration project or farm. You will be able to see how the soil biome responds in weeks way before you start to see above ground responses to the strategies you are using. And you'll be able to assess the quality of your compost and liquid amendments, so you'll know how impactful they could be before you put in the effort of applying them to the soil. This is kind of like having x-ray vision that enables you to see what's happening beneath the surface of the soil. It's a real superpower. Tool number four, the introduction to permaculture. Permaculture is a regenerative design approach that can be applied to just about anything from water management, growing systems, dwellings, and much more. This is another great tool to have in your box as permaculture principles can add tons of value to any project. This July, with the Ecosystem Restoration Bundle, you can register for the Soil Food Web Foundation courses for just $3,800, saving $1,200, and you'll get these other three powerful tools absolutely free saving a total of $3,800 off. That's an incredible savings of 50% off the total bundle value, which is $7,600. We're putting these four amazing tools together because we really want to set our students up for success. Whether you're a farmer looking to transition to regenerative ag while having a positive impact on the wider ecosystem, a budding soil food web professional, or someone who wants to dedicate themselves to the cause of ecosystem restoration, these four tools combined will give you a great foundation. Come join the soil revolution today and be a part of the soil lution. If you are looking for a way to make. And now I show my tech wizardry if it will happen. Okay. Voila. Uh, we're going to pop out of here just for a second. And what a cool option. Um, as a soil food web school mentor and uh, researcher, previous academic, I will tell you that uh, all of the concepts that we teach are rooted in, in thoroughly researched science. And um, we have an awesome team. Like you, some of the folks actually featured in the video are some of our mentors. And we have such a great great community of people here at the Soil Food Web School. So if you are curious about those programs, um, it is pretty fun to get to work one-on-one -on -one with folks all around the world. So thanks for watching that video and getting to be inspired in another way. All right, now it is time. The moment you've all been waiting for. Once I can share my screen, drum roll, please. Here we go. Okay, team. So as I ask these questions, my goal for you is to be able to use them as a launching off point to share ideas with one another. So if anything does inspire you, feel free to jump in and share. Otherwise, if it works better, I am happy to call on you and, and make sure that folks are answering, but let's get going. So questions and answers. I would like to begin a career in soil health and would like to know the best path to beginning such an impactful career. I'm on a limited budget and my education level is a high school diploma. All right, folks. What would you say? <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 the gateway drug for most of us was this book um, called Teeming with Microbes. And if it's, you know, if you're in a place where it's just like, I want to get started, I want to get the basics, and money is a serious option, like, get out there and uh, obstacle option, ha, not an option. Um, <laughs> you know, get out there and read books like that. Get online. Social media has a huge presence. There's lots of people doing soil food web work and sharing, you know, what they're doing, what their experiences it is, how it's going. I mean, that's definitely where we started before we decided to invest in classes. Um, and, you know, we could get a lot going from just that. And then eventually it became uh, obvious that we really wanted to dive deeper and take those foundation courses and even complete the whole program. Um, 
but yeah, it's an investment and it's not just an investment of money. It's an investment of time. You know, it's, it's, it's not like you start the foundation courses and boom, it's easy. It's, it's a lot of information that you go through and it takes time. So you want to, you want to be ready to take the classes when you sign up for the classes. So you can prepare yourself in lots of ways. And don't worry. I don't have a degree either. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> we still do a good job. And that is one of the beautiful things about this work is that it is so many of these concepts are just on a natural level intuitive of working with soil and plants. And we know what our body has wisdom, right? And if Anne B. Clay talks about this and, you know, we, the flavors that are delicious are telling us good things about nutritious food. There's so much that we know intuitively that we haven't gotten to honor, you know, productively in the world. So remember that you already have all of your own life experience coming into exactly where you are. Katie, Fennell, anything to add? Well, I can say from my own experience, uh, you know, volunteering somewhere, you know, even if you're not exactly sure where you want to go or what you want to do, there are a lot of opportunities. You don't have to come all the way to Brazil to volunteer, but there are places all around the world where you can volunteer to at least get your hands dirty and start to interact. I learned so much just in the first few weeks that I was here in my first contact. Yeah, and I would say um, not having a background in biology or so in microbiology or conventional farming is actually an asset. I have a master's in finance, so I had no bias in entering that world, even though later I had to make an effort to understand how this whole conventional work functions and why. Uh, however, I didn't have any, let's say, self-limiting thought in terms of what is doable. So yeah, no worries, uh, full on without without having any degree or whatever. That's a really excellent point, Renan. And I will also add that coming, growing up in the current US-based, at least, agricultural way of thinking, it's a very agronomy-minded perspective in which we stick plants in the ground and then we are in charge as human beings of taking care of every single thing that the plants need. And the paradigm shift that needs to happen is really one of trust, of trusting that the plants know how to take care of themselves when they're provided with the diverse community that they need. So yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks, Renal. Wonderful. So next question we have from Jim. Oh. <laughs> you're on mute again you're muted <laughs> this is a good one we're doing real well <laughs> in a minute oh, i'm rolling with it so uh our next question is from jim how can we start to generate income once we've started the soil food web course bundle let's talk about how folks pathways to starting to think about because in a lot of society, money is one of those things that we do need to spend in terms of value. So how do folks, how can folks best set themselves up to be successful financially in this world? Uh, I mean, I can take that one, which is just sharing my own experience after I, I got uh, uh, certified as an official Soil Food Web consultant and appeared on um, the Soil Food Web School website. Um, people have started to call me, which means like this investment that was er that I did earlier in my time with the couple, little saving that I had got multiplied by I don't know now ten times, maybe one hundred times. I mean, I've earned yes, I've earned enough. So then, by having the visibility that the soil food web provides, suddenly um, I, I didn't have to do any marketing. But I mean, I was I was one of the first on the website, right? Which means now a lot more and more people are embarking on the Soil Food Web School. So there is more people that may be appearing, right? And of course, depending where you are based on the on the in the world, you have zones where you have more of those consultants present, and other part of the world, like here in South America or Europe, where you have less. So. I guess it's about also to figuring out the one strategy, you know, in terms of where is the demand. I know that Africa uh, is one of those countries where there is a lot to do, right? English speaking. Uh, yeah, that's my take. 
I guess to, to expand off of that, Renald, it's like I, just in California alone, there's what, 100 million acres of California and 50 million of them are agricultural land. There's like, there's no way that any, you know, the small group of us that there is right now has even a chance of just tackling California, you know, and yeah. expand that out to the rest of the world. That's yeah, there's yeah. so much agricultural land and so much forest land that's being destroyed everywhere. But yeah, sorry, that's not really on the question, but just off that. Yeah. Topic. <laughs> no, I think it is. I think it is. The truth is like um, there is a, there's enough space for all of us to actually do it. And uh, I would just come back to some sort of, kind of trusting if you really feel that this is a mission for you well that's gonna happen because there are people out there crying out loud for solutions operational solutions i can just i can tell you like i told you earlier like per week five six emails asking me for budgets right so yes it's there is a market there i like the idea of applying these regenerative principles to our mindset about the regenerative I mean, market, if you want to call it that, um, the industry, but also the like, these solutions, these, these collaborative ways of working together to have hope. And um, the more, it really is the more the merrier. And so I think even once we do have a world in which there is a, comp a compost producer that makes really excellent, beautiful, biologically complete compost all around the world, we're still gonna need people to understand different facets of that and work with that differently and teach that different. There's so many facets, just as nature emulates multiple ecological niches, the same is true in the industry. There's so many different aspects of having a career in this world and being successful and thriving. Um, Katie, do you have any other thoughts on what it means to make a living, be okay? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm definitely still figuring it out. I definitely don't have the answers, um, but I think yeah, I think what I I what I said and Hanal also said this idea of like, I really am a big believer in intuition and intention, and so I'm not a person that has a five year plan or ten year plan. I don't believe in that, but I do believe in having a strong intention. So you know. I am in a moment also, you know, I've been here for seven years and um, I want to be able to have more financial sustainability and build a career. And so I'm also opening myself up to what are the different possibilities. I want to be here. I want to stay here. But what are the other things? You know, I'm open to doing other things. And I think exactly what you're saying there. There's a market and I, and I see so many of the skills that I've now gained here being at Sinal and doing the work I've done is, is being valued more and more. And I, even in this change of like seven years, when I first arrived here, people didn't really even get, or at least in my world, didn't really understand what I was doing. But now I see that people, I explain things and people get it much more quickly because of climate change, because people are more conscient, conscious about this. So I feel like the, the skills are the world. If there's a demand and if we have the skills, then eventually <laughs> the financial part should come along. <laughs> Yeah, I would add, like, you know, there's a lot that you can do to to make money with this. Um, there's just, I mean, there's so many different aspects of the soil food web work. So, I mean, sometimes I get to take photos, you know, with my microscope for, for money. <laughs> sometimes we are doing soil samples for people or applying compost extracts and teas. Um, but the people that I've seen that have been the most successful with this in the beginning um, put a lot of volunteer time in. You know, you get out there, you talk to people, you do your thing. And you do it regardless of what you're making. And eventually people just see you doing the good work and you get offered jobs. And I mean, for us, we've been, since the beginning, we started Catalyst before we were consultants for sure. Um, we just graduated the foundation courses and just dove right into large scale compost. So uh, if you're a self-starter, like you can, you can get going with a business immediately um, or as you're doing it, it just depends on how you take up the information and what you do with it in real life. Yeah, and I, I want to add something here, which is also coming from my own experience uh, with my two companies. It's like we are still in the in this time when what we offering, what we are offering, there is no real market yet. Which means it's not like you are, a, I don't know, a technical engineer for uh, processing food, right? We are kind of building up this new demand of yeah, we need to regenerate our soils, right? So then we are participating all in this uh, 
it's kind of a you know startup type of thing in terms of industry if i use some you know some business semantics and there are many resources out there for entrepreneurship um, many other programs as well that are synergistically collaborative um I mean, there's a lot of free things as well, such as you can get a SCORE mentor, that's S-C-O-R-E, that can give you some business advice or talk about taxes and some of those specific logistical things don't, that don't just naturally come from like studying ecology or thinking, looking at nematodes all day on a microscope. Um, there are some adulting things that have to happen at times um, that are less fun to think about, but also remember that you're not alone. You may be creating your own thing, but you're not alone because you have this community. You're already here. If you're listening to this message right now, that means that you're already tapped into this community and we're all here for you. So um, I think the more that we embrace that notion as well, the more that we can all support each other. So uh, I'm gonna throw another question up on the screen for us. And this one is, what is the biggest hindrance to permaculture, agroforestry, syntropic growing, to disrupting and hopefully replacing the current commercial agricultural models? Is it a need to refine these methods so that they can be successfully scaled to a commercial level? Or is it more so a sociological issue of convincing farmers that it is possible to have a profitable, profitable farm that is also good for the environment? What do y'all think? Yeah, I mean, uh... Well, I, I guess when we got started with working with large scale farmers, I thought like, yeah, it's, it's really about just changing their mind. But um, a lot of the things that we come up against, especially when you're talking about permaculture, is these, when you're at a large scale, there's machines already created for harvesting, um, for spraying, for tilling. And so a lot of these farmers, especially, you know, if they're really large scale farmers, small changes cost millions of dollars. You know, adjusting spray nozzles to two feet above where they are now could be a million dollar project when you're looking at um, the size of it. And so I think a lot of it is just gonna take technical work, figuring out how we adapt machines, create machines, you know, how we work on the actual um, application of biologicals and harvesting. Um, it's a real actual issue that's beyond like I know so many farmers that really want to do this they really want to change but it's like okay what do we do with the tractor to make it work like can we invent something can we buy something um, do we need to source it from another country um, so there's a lot of logistical issues even if the heart and the mind is in the right place um, that I didn't really consider till I started working in the field. There's also like crop insurances, like some crop insurances won't cover your crop if you don't add X amount of fertilizer, right? So it's even like the, the insurance companies are actually a hindrance to this as well, because they're thinking if the farmer's not going to add this much fertilizer to this field, which is some number that some ag agronomists have come up with, then that's, you know, they're, they're putting their entire livelihood in jeopardy. So there, you know, there's a lot of different factors for that. Yeah, and I want to add something, a uh, quote, actually, one of the farmers that has been appearing on the Soul Food web channels, interviews, webinars, it's Rick Clark, and uh, he, he worded what I feel, it's a, it's, it's a movement which is farmers led, it's, it's just like we have to accept to work with what the context is giving us, as Keisha was saying, you have a tractor, you have a sprayer, you have a whatever deep shank, you know what I mean? And the truth is the one that comes to us and just really want, they really want it. So farmers from, from an actual, you know, farmer-based perspective, they are the best do-it-yourself persons I've ever met of my life, which cool. means problem solving live. It's like, it's not about having a plan B, it's having a, a plan C, D, E, and there you go, right? So it's about really trusting it that we can do it. And the, the takeaway message is like, have you got the willingness to actually overcome the challenges? Because life is full of challenges, right? We're dealing with nature. We're dealing with mechanics. So then we are in between <clears throat> trying to make sure that we have the same vision to go forward and actually make it happen. And it's not about having, let's say, or oh, the kind of a product mindset oriented, you know, you go to the fast food and you have your burger. No, it's not like that. It's the, it's the actual 
step towards it, accepting that we have a direction, but we don't really know what we're going to get. So from a scientific perspective, it's like, okay, we monitor and we bring the farmer with us in this, in this whole journey of like, you are as much as good as we are with the microbiology. You have the tools, you have the knowledge, you have the experience, et cetera. And we have to team up, right? Doing it together. That's my take. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when you come onto a farm, right? Like I am not the expert watermelon grower or strawberry grower. I know how to grow microbes. I know how to get them out. They are the expert in that whole scenario. So yeah, we're coming in and we're telling them, this is how you get microbes out. This is what, you know, this is how we want to do it. Then these kind of things, but they're actually the ones who are going to be, yeah, pulling their machines apart and changing every little fitting and doing all these things. And we're just there to kind of assist them in that transition. It's kind of our big job. In this. And they are. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely, absolutely right. They are the smartest people. Like the the things that the farmers come up with are just like it's another level of education for us. Every time we get a new job, I'm like, I don't know if so food would prepare me for this one, but they did. <laughs> it turns out we get through it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it's also this thing of like this education that we all had. Like, okay, well, you learn business, you learn this and that, and this is in a frame. Boom, that's what you learn. This is what is supposed to be in your life. Wrong. I'm sorry. Life <laughs> is different. It's about problem solving, right? This is the, actually the essence of it, right? And also, I'd say from that perspective, like having received the Soul Food Web and then having been capable of applying it for real, then it opened so many other doors, right? So then we talk now about cover crops, we talk about enzyme, we talk about integrated pest management, agroforestry, food nutrition, et cetera, et cetera, which is kind of brings this whole sense of complexity. Farming is the most complex work on earth we're dealing with nature and so for the ecosystem well eco uh, restoration camp uh, uh, camps thing it's the same we're dealing with nature it's complex we have to accept that to just do some meaningful job if i may <laughs> yeah how what have you noticed about mindset shifting from embracing that ecotourism you're describing Katie, um away from you know other other ways of generating income in the country like what what sorts of mindset shifts are you noticing amongst the folks you work with yeah i mean i think there's there's this aspect of well there's the ecotourism but also i think a lot about the jackfruit because that's something that we've done a lot of because we're trying to create a new market and so there's a lot of i mean with the jackfruit there's a lot of like people have no idea and then they try it and then there's just like a total a total like explosion like wait wait this is possible and then of course one thing is to change the idea, but then the other thing is in practice, how do you, how do you actually do that? So just also kind of adding to what you guys are talking about, I've here, there really is this, there are people who are interested who want to learn, but the incentives, the economic incentives and like the opportunities are still really limited. So, you know, you can do a training and the farmer's like, this is great, but now what, like now I'm going to plant this and who am I going to sell it to? How is it going to get there? So I think, you know, we don't really necessarily have the answers, but there's, there's definitely, um, it's also a mind, a change of mindset of how, of problem solving of like, of getting people involved to solve the problem together. You know, we don't have the answer where you're going to sell it, but you know, when we connect people, you see that, oh, some person is working on this. Some person wants to have a, a place where they can sell products. Oh, nearby, this could be a point on the trail where you could sell it. So I think there's a lot of the kind of mobilizing and connecting people to have the, to change our mindsets together. <laughs> Which it sounds like is a shift towards first, like curiosity into creativity of like working with, okay, well, what do we have and how can we apply these principles? It's so interesting. Um, I like to apply Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic, a book all about creativity, like shifting away from fear towards creativity, um, specifically about like art and other things, but also just living our lives and, and working together in that, that sense as well. Um, I enjoy that that shift. And I feel like a lot of what I'm noticing about this work and what I'm hearing from multiple different sources is that it's breaking down some of these preconceived problems that are not, they don't have to be problems. Like this notion of money or nature, it doesn't necessarily have to be true. And that's the, like being an ecologist and wanting to save the rainforest and going to biology and, and going to do a postdoc so that I could someday save the rainforest. But really I was just 
trying to carve out a career for myself in publications wasn't getting me any closer to saving the rainforest. And yet, just by working with the microbes and working in community and working in this deeper community, I think is what I've discovered is getting me closer towards that deeper goal that I have wanted to do in my life. And so that to me is the most fulfilling. So in circling back to the, the key point of the question is what is the barrier really from major adaptation? I'm like, why is this not being talked about more as much as climate change and carbon credits and all of these things are being thrown around in conversation. It feels like all around us. Um, to me, it's, it's that mindset shift and, and awareness of what is possible, which comes from imagination, right? Like we all had to imagine this before we could get here. Um, so thanks for sharing yours. Cool. Next question. So we've talked a bit about degrees specifically, but I also wanna talk about access to resources because not everyone has the same access, have the same experiences. Um, so just briefly, it seems as though courses like the Soil Food Web Bundle and Life Choices like Katie's are only accessible to people who have a lot of access to wealth and resources. Sometimes land, land ownership is also not an equal available resource. How can people without access to these participate in work? Um, I know you mentioned volunteer positions, internships, um, but what really, what makes an impact? Are there grants, scholarships, or other sources of funding available to make it possible for more people who would otherwise not be able to participate in environmental movements? And because this is a celebration of ecosystem restoration camps, Katie, I wonder if you'd actually kick this off again and tell us how folks could get involved in um, being a part of your environmental movement that's happening down there. Yeah, I mean, I think like us and many of the other camps, we have volunteer opportunities and, um, you know, where you don't have to have money. Of course, I mean, you have to have money to be able to get here, of course. But I would say that there are, like, for example, when I came here, I applied and got a small little scholarship. Obviously, I was in my university um, to be able to pay for my first flight to get down here and initial things like that. And there are other grants I've seen um, for like land stewardship and especially, especially small grants, especially for young people, that there is a movement of wanting to get more people involved. So of course, this you're highlighting a problem that is real and does exist. And I believe there should be more funding and more scholarships so that more people can do this. So you don't have to take such a big risk um, and you have to be, don't have to be so not everyone has to be so courageous and so uh not even courageous but you know being willing to take the risk um and yeah i mean we have volunteer offerings i think a lot of the camps do um so yeah yeah i would i would add to that um you know it, it, it grants are a great way to get money for this kind of work um when we're working in la almost not all of our jobs but i would say 50 50 percent of our jobs are funded by nonprofits who um, you know, they use the money that they get to support people like us that are out there doing work, making a change. Um, and also just, it, it does seem like when you're jumping off to go abroad that you're going to need a lot of money to do that. You know, I, I, I always wanted to go travel. I want, always wanted to go volunteer in South America and like, you know, spend years on the road. And, um, you know, when we finally did it, like we weren't wealthy people. We didn't make much money at all, actually. <laughs> and um, we were able to, you know, barring the plane ticket, go down to South America and like we worked down there. We, we made a living doing what everybody else does, selling food and, you know, just making it happen. And so there's all sorts of creative ways that you can go about getting started. But I, I do believe like if you want to, you know, generate a lot of income, like to pay for the school or to, uh, you know, start a business or something like this, grants are probably your best option. And there's a lot of them right now that are focused on um, ecological work. I also want to elevate something that Kevin added to the chat. There are people with land who would co-op with those who don't have land to regenerate the land together. I am one. So there might also be an element of this that is human to human, maybe overcoming some awkward layer of communication and getting to know one another and figuring out who has which like natural tendencies to do what they wanna be doing in the world, but also who has which resources to be able to support each other in doing that. So yeah, more and more ways of connecting to one another. We need a mycelial network of resources and regenerating. Yeah, and I want to add something here. I mean, <clears throat> when you think about food, okay, farmers 
are the one who are feeding the world. Okay, we don't all have land or whatever means. However, there is other, let's say, side topics that are associated with food. Today, it's about nutrition. How nutrition, nutritious this food come? It is, right? Where does that come from? Well, when you understand the correlation with soil health, soil microbiology and ecosystem thinking, well, you can engage in another leg of this whole supply chain thing, right? So by embarking with like, let's say, the course in Soil Food Web or doing some eco ecosystem restoration camps, well, you can also let this creative uh, motion happen and just like find a little a new, a new leg that we don't know, right? Uh, personally, I talk about all that with most people I meet. She's like, I'm a geek, maybe. Anyway. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. So getting a little bit more specific, zooming in here, um, how can one convince farmers addicted to fertilizer and glyphosate to take advice or even pay for it? I sometimes talk to farmers about changing their practices, but it falls on deaf ears. And I'll also translate this for Katie, your lens, talking to folks about jackfruit versus meat consumption. I'm sure there's also a layer of conversation there. Um, so feel free to share whatever comes up. What you have noticed is actually that like hook that can grab someone's curiosity about what you have to offer. Well, I would say, I mean, also we've done a lot of courses because Tinal is a center for, for education and we've you know brought a lot of landowners and farmers here. And honestly, the most convincing thing is just seeing it really exist because you can say everything, but if someone comes and sees it, they believe it. They see it to believe it. Not saying that that necessarily changes everything or the people when they hear jackfruit, they're like, oh, that sounds so weird. That's so gross. And then they try it and then like, wow, this tastes like chicken. And, you, and it totally changes things. <laughs> so I think I think that's why play, this is what I believe. Places like Sinal and your guys' work, it's important to show examples because if it's just talking and hearing about things, people don't really buy into it. But if you see, not that we're perfect, we have a long way to go, but it's kind of like a lighthouse showing, okay, this is possible or some of this is possible. That's, that's funny. That's exactly what I was going to say as well. It's like most farmers, as they are very adaptive and very like good at dealing with difficult situations and doing this thing, are also very hard nosed, very stubborn, and are kind of set in their ways. And that so they have a very strong dichotomy there of like, yes, we can adapt to the situations in the farming, but they still like want to stick to their guns kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's we do not spend our time trying to convince a farmer straight face to face. It's we work on the neighbor's property, the neighbor who's already interested in this and they want to go forward with this. And so we're doing the work on their land. And then the neighbor comes over and looks and he's like, what, well, what are you guys doing over there? That stuff looks really good. You know, it's, it is, it's the seeing is believing for a lot of this to kind of take hold. Cause you know, I mean, all day long, everybody's talking to you about this and that and this and that. And it's like, until you act, like, honestly, <clears throat> right now, until you see it with your own eyes, like it's hard to believe everybody in it, what everybody's saying. Yeah, we've had like we had one experience where it was a he's a he's one of our best customers to date now but he showed up at our at our compost lot to buy I think it was a, a, yard. a yard of compost and he was just like in complete disbelief uh Brian Vogg who's another soil consultant had sent him to us and he came in with the attitude very much like this compost is expensive I'm probably only going to be here once this is ridiculous um, I'm not going to see you again unless it does miraculous things. And, and now he started a business based off of our compost. He's a weekly customer. Um, we're <laughs> friends with his entire family. And he's changing the entire valley where he lives. Um, he's convincing farmers by doing all around him all the time um, that it is a good move. And, you know, he's probably done more for the valley than, you know, any one of us could because he's a little, he's a farmer. He's been there since he was a little boy. All these people have known him his whole life and, you know, him being a little hard nosed and not wanting to convert over and then doing it and succeeding. Everyone else is like, we're in, we're in, we're in, you know, there's people lining up for trials with him. So, um, Luckily, our job isn't to go out and knock on farmers' doors and say, hey, you're doing this wrong, because I guarantee, like, uh, we wouldn't be getting a good response if we were. <laughs> mm. Yeah, my take here is uh, when I first started uh, my first big project five years ago in Latvia, um, the, the chemical prices were not as high as today. 
uh, which is which today is a clear asset to talk to farmer, right? Just like how resilient are you to uh, chemical prices, right? I mean, we know all the oil stories and all that. I mean, most of the chemical, the synthetic product are done because of through the oil industry. Anyway, my take was pretty simple at that time with a very clear posture with a farmer asking him, how much do you pay per hectare for your program, your current fertilizing program? Okay, well, then you're going to save that, but I'm going to do it my way. So this money that you save, you give me. And we're going to, and then we're going to just balance the thing out, figure it out. Does that work? Et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is that on at, at a certain level, I mean, at a certain scale, uh, farmers are businessmen, right? They know very much their numbers. So, I mean, for me, what helps me, it's like my background in finance. I talk the same language as them. So my point is there is multiple entry points to tackle that. I tried it, of course, I, because I work big scale. So then my conversations are with money involved. <clears throat> But you can take it from the social responsibility, human health, ecosystem, and, 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 and there you name it, right? And then you can even do a bundle of it. But it's not about convincing. It's about just sharing what we believe and let that sprout in the farmer's mindset. It sounds like a common theme I'm hearing here is that there's an uh, imagination gap out there that by showing and telling these stories, we really get to fill that gap and, and help then those folks become the storytellers and become the, the ones sharing. So it's important to make sure also in all of these that we're incorporating multiple different stories and each plant has its own story. As uh, we have a wonderful presentation, Chef Inside Craig talks about each plant having its own story in human history, it's amazing. So the more we tell our stories and can refine this, the more that we can set ourselves up to succeed but so the other element of having that imagination gap, not only from adapting these methods and being open to something like moving away from at the same chemical fertilizers, there's also for me anyway, there was an imagination gap when I was in my academic career for what I could do. It took a total leap of faith, uh, you know, or whatever to essentially stop, to try something totally different. So there is an element of like, it might feel scary at times. Does that feel true for any of y'all? So it, it's not yeah. always like fun and picking roses every day, right? So the, no, true. just talking about the reality of it, <laughs> but then letting well, true, that be okay, I mean. right? Letting some of that fear and unknown be like, that's part of what farmers get to go through as they're taking this, this leap of working with you or changing the way that they're working with something. Yeah, I, mean, I want to add something else, if I may. Please. Um, you know, in the conversation with a farmer, most of them, you know, if you are a business farmer, you forget that you feed people, right? You forget they forget because their their uh, buyers are massive seeds grow buyers, and they do whatever with it. They don't even know, right? So how how to carry like this responsibility message to these people? Right. I mean, it's very harsh. Sometimes I'm I'm struggling with it because I'm I have a strong, uh, let's say, character, and I can be really bold and really direct. But sometimes this approach cannot cannot work because I don't know with who I'm talking about. So it just adds up an, another layer of, you know, in human relationships, how to just you know even things out and just keeps you know having the conversation going because once the conversation it's got <laughs> over. Forget it. You you lost it. I enjoy the same personality traits. <laughs> I hear you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like uh, the, those statements like, did you realize that there is a correlation in between the chemical use and the rates of cancers? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Right. They don't clean out their spray tank. Sometimes I can get very sharp. <laughs> I'm learning to yeah. walk. <laughs> I mean, I had questions from farmers because of using compost extract in their sprayers that it may damage the sprayer itself. And it's like what they should do to clean it up afterwards with their ferny products. And I, 
I, I mean, I answered it very gently, but I, inside of me, I was like, what are you talking about? Bro? It's about <laughs> just nature stuff. Right. Anyway. As if the stuff they were using in, in that sprayer before wouldn't have damaged it. <laughs> Yeah. No, but the truth is, the truth is, this is a hurdle to tackle. I mean, at, at the scale that I'm working at, now they have, uh, they all have fancy machines filled up with techniques, technology, filters, you name it. And then like this year in Latvia, for example, the agronomist responsible for the machinery said, oh, well, we got clogged, we got blocked once in the field. So then you don't put your compost anymore in the machine. What do you do with that? So like, all right, okay, well, let's buy an old one and let's keep <laughs> working at it. You see, I mean, that's kind of uh, how flexible we have to be. Indeed. Real life is that we're always dealing with barriers that are screens that get clogged with compost. <laughs> <laughs> Those are our smallest and most impressive barriers. <laughs> that is a big yeah. barrier to this, this kind of work, yeah. right? Not yeah. clogging the screen. <laughs> yes. So speaking of barriers, um, and then just one final question for our team, um, specific one. My yard is infested with bindweed. I hate to have to use Roundup, but it's the only way I know of to kill the roots, basically using a very dilute solution in water bottles and shoving the bindweed tops into that. Is there any way your approach could eliminate it without Roundup? I hate to contaminate my land, but I don't see any option. Oh my Let's gosh. Talk bindweed. I want to answer that one. I want to answer that one. I Get love it. bindweed. I miss my bindweed. I, I used to live in a house that was covered with bindweed and I was in the same position. Like, what am I going to do to grow food in this garden? Um, and what's really, really cool about bindweed is it grows really fast. It's an epic green material for composting. So I started composting my bindweed and I, I swear there's an intelligence in the plant that once it realized I was cutting it all the time, it moved to another location. It stopped growing in my garden. Like the pathways were, it got to a point where I was like, I could use more bindweed. I was literally watering it to get <laughs> <laughs> you know more biomass because when we're making compost like biomass is a huge thing getting green material when it's dry outside is difficult here in california bindweed is one of those plants that stays green it's got long roots it taps into the it taps into the groundwater obviously because it grows so well and so with a lot of these like obnoxious weeds that we have um, I put my effort into harvesting them before they seed and using them to make fertility with compost right there on site. And I mean, almost every permaculture person I know, like, goes through this moment where it's like, you know, what, what do we do with all these weeds? And then once you start cover cropping with it, using it to grow microbes, it almost becomes a resource that you miss when it's gone. Because really, once you do improve that soil and you get a really nice, healthy community of fungi and bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, all the good guys in there, um, the bindweed doesn't really like to grow there so much anymore, and neither do any of these other early successional awesome producing plants. So um, weeds are my friend, and it's like the one thing I teach when we're talking about making compost is like, if you don't like the plant, learn to make friends with it, cut it before it can seed, and turn it into fertility. It could be your biggest asset right now, um, and you don't even know it. Sorry about the speech, Hunter. I do the same thing with wasps. I just love the unloved. <laughs> wasps, huh? That's cool. Predators, come on, Adrian. Oh, no, I know. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> no I'm there with you. <laughs> yeah. No glyphosate. <laughs> I, yep. Let's leave all the asides aside. That's what I like to say. <laughs> Renan, yeah. any, any stories as well? With, I mean, that was a great answer, Tisha. So, <clears throat> if anything yeah, comes yeah, up. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so from my experience, um, of course, the weed conversation is, uh, is the killer story. Because from a farmer's mindset, of course, this is what they are all after. Um, so using again, farmers, the farmers uh, creativity that I mean, or just existing tools. Um, I recall when I first got in um, the soil food web, framework and try to apply it it's just like okay went full on it's like okay no need of this no need of that and and the truth is like when you transition a system it's about you know taking the system from point a to point wherever right and then we were trying to figure out so within this whole uh transition time frame we we may have to just like light till or light disc again 
So we keep this pressure down while in the same time we are, as, uh, as has just been said, just like building up on the soil ecosystem uh, on the microbiology side and then adding up some more cover crops. The, what Rick Wade is doing is absolutely fantastic in terms of weed management. Uh, it takes some some humbleness about like okay we can we have to just those tools and we use it but still we are also dynamically and proactively building strategies for the cover crop in terms of weed pressure management while we are transitioning the system so that means this is not a silver go or golden bullet it's about transitioning right and how we do that with the whole humble that we we have just like okay making sure that uh, we will have some issues and stuff so yes no no roundup is possible people are already doing it but it takes time that's that's the mindset that needs to be changed it's not a pre-cooked product it's it's a work in progress absolutely yeah it's a d dynamic living system and those plants to be able to support a microbial community do need a nutrition plan as well um and you know not all additions in the chemical mindset are equally as toxic to the plants and the microbes and the whole system. So figuring out which are the most devastating to your system and which practices to start to eliminate out, you know, Nicole Masters talks about the five M's of, um, you know, the limiting factors, the mindset, microbes, uh, organic matter, she cheats a little bit on that one, uh, minerals, and management. So uh, some combination of all of that needs to be a part of the conversation. Um, but as we are at time, I wanna make sure to take a moment and give each of you a moment to share if you were talking to yourselves, let's say five years ago, what do you wish you would have known? I wish I would have known that it was gonna work out. <laughs> that that big jump leap of faith into this career was um it was a big one so yeah i wish that i could go back and be like don't worry it's gonna be great <laughs> you'll figure it out <laughs> yeah, yeah i would i would definitely say the say the same thing i think i was um i had a lot of in the beginning kind of this anxiety of is, am I take you know, this anxiety, am I taking a risk? Am I, um, did I make the wrong choice? And I think in the beginning, I, or I could have enjoyed some more moments without that anxiety. And now when I look back, I'm like, no, this is all part of the process. I'll, you know, and I also wish that maybe I'd stayed a little bit longer in the, you know, when I was doing all the volunteering in the gardens and things like that, I, now that I moved up to the fundraise and all the more like management stuff, I do think, and now that I don't have as much time to do the practical stuff. I wish that maybe I'd like let myself enjoy, you know, enjoy doing that a little bit longer and not feel bad, you know, and, and not, I felt the need to so quickly move into organizational stuff. So sometimes I feel I, I, I could have been taking out weeds a little bit longer from the garden. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, my turn. Well, um, so I'm really enthusiastic about what I'm doing, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe five years ago, I would, would I've loved to know that I'll be so happy and and joyful to do it. But on the other note, on another side, uh, the truth is like, shit, we need a lot more people doing the job. I mean, <laughs> that's just, I mean, I mean, sorry to say, to just you know, bring the kind of uh, negative side of it. But like, I mean, we as a com human community on this planet, we are just extracting the whole thing, cutting all thing down at the rate we have no idea, which means like, yeah, we need uh, more like bold people and, uh, you know, willing to just uh, go with the vision and just make it happen. That's what I would have loved to know five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you all. I would agree with all of that and also add that I, I wish I had knew five years ago around this time, I had just defended my dissertation. I was about to go off to my postdoc and I wish, I wish I had told myself that just like Katie's saying to savor, to really just be in this moment, connect with, like it's the people, the connections, the moment, the sense of each like handful of soil that really get to fill our lives and to pay attention to 
which beliefs no longer serve me and to be able to let myself free myself of those sooner. Just let imagination flood right in y'all. So with that, um, I'm going to share a final screen. Um, one quick reminder that all of these replays are available from this month of delicious conversations, how to accelerate soil and ecosystem restoration, ecosystem restoration examples, our main event, which had Sadhguru and John D. Liu, along with Elaine Ingham, saving our soils and ecosystems, as well as today's how you can impact your ecosystem careers in ecosystem restoration and regenerative ag. Just a small mouthful. So feel free to check out our YouTube channel that is continually populating. We also have an educational webinar that we're planning uh, for the next month or two. So keep an eye out for that one. That one should be very exciting. Um, and yeah, check us out at webinar.soilfoodweb.com is another place to find that. So panelists, it is my great pleasure to get to spend this time with you and have a, a beautiful conversation. I feel very full today. Thank you. Thank you. Fun. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you, time. Katie. Yeah, good to meet you, Katie. Mm. Oh, it was great to meet everyone. Come visit okay. me in Brazil. Uh, deal. <laughs> we'll be there. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos.